We should celebrate. Right. It's important to celebrate. It's good to celebrate, right? Celebrate. 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 But don't forget to keep running the race, right? Celebrate. But don't neglect to finish strong. In Christ, those who are believers, we have every reason to celebrate. And those who are in Christ, we have every reason to run and to run and to finish strong. As the author of Hebrews puts it, run with perseverance the race that has been set before you. As we'll see in a couple weeks in Philippians chapter 3 at the very end, Paul speaks about straining towards the goal. We celebrate and we fail to run and to finish strong. When we accept Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, and then we fall into a routine of religious habit and boredom. We celebrate and we fail to run and finish the race. When we accept Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, and we fail to seek to mature and to grow in Him. We celebrate and fail to run the race when we celebrate the blessed assurance that we have in Jesus Christ and we fail to share that blessed assurance with others. We celebrate when we celebrate the blessed assurance of our salvation and we fail to run the race when we then turn around and go back and rest upon the hopes and dreams of the world. Celebrate, but make sure that you run the race and you finish strong. As we've been looking through the book of Philippians, these past two weeks, looking at chapter 2, two weeks ago, Paul gives us good reason to celebrate. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, we saw that as believers, we can celebrate because Christ humbled himself. Let's celebrate that. And then we saw in verses 12 through 18 last week, Paul gives us another reason to celebrate. Celebrate because it is Christ who is work, God who is working in you. But as well within those texts, as you celebrate, we have every reason to continue to run the race. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, celebrate because Christ has humbled himself. Now run the race, follow Christ's example of humility. Chapter 2, verses 18, 19, 12 through 18, excuse me. Celebrate because it is God who is working in you. Now run the race by working out your own salvation. That is to say, now that you have been given salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, use that salvation. Exercise the salvation that you've been given. Because God has first loved you, celebrate that. Now run the race and love others. Because God has first forgiven you, celebrate that. Now run the race and forgive others. Because first you had the salvation through Jesus Christ, now celebrate that by sharing the good news with others. We must celebrate and run and finish the race. This morning's text that we'll look at, at first glance, it may look just like a travel itinerary. Timothy goes here, Epaphroditus goes there. This is when they're going to travel. But within the context of chapter 2 and the rest of this letter to the church at Philippi, we see that it's so much more. It's not just a travel itinerary of who went where and when, but it describes how Paul works out his own salvation. The travel itinerary, more importantly, describes how Paul humbles himself, describes how Paul works out his own salvation. An area that we oftentimes can neglect to run the race and to finish strong, and we'll see this morning, is an area of caring for others. So oftentimes we can celebrate the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ, but an area that we oftentimes can neglect in running the race is in caring for others. 
And so this morning, we'll see three things. We'll see three obstacles, three challenges that can keep us from running the race and caring for others as God would have us do. And we'll see how to overcome that. How do we overcome those obstacles and how do we care for others and run the race as such? This morning, if you would, let's turn to our text. We're going to be Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 19 through 30. Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30. You can find the book of Philippians in the New Testament towards the right-hand side of your Bibles. The New Testament begins with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Keep going. Romans, keep going. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. We'll be in the second chapter of Philippians, looking at verse 19 until the end of the chapter. Earlier in chapter 2, Paul exhorts the believers, exhorts the church at Philippi. Christ has humbled himself, therefore follow his example of humility. Partner with others in the gospel, how? By being of one mind, by being united in the spirit with God. Partner in the gospel by considering the interests of others more important than yourself, by considering others more significant than yourself. And then secondly, there in verses 12 through 18, celebrate because it is God who works in you. It is God who wills and works in you. And because of that, utilize that salvation that you have been given. Here in verses 19 through 30, we see how Paul orchestrates Timothy and Epaphroditus, how he sends them out. And we see this is how Paul lives out verses 1 through 18. So what is an obstacle we oftentimes face? And how does Paul overcome these obstacles? First, let's look at verses 19 through 25 and identify the first obstacle. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. Timothy is Paul's disciple. Paul picked Timothy up at a very young and early age. Timothy has followed Paul throughout the region through many of his missionary travels as Paul has journeyed, as Paul has been persecuted, as Paul has been tried, as Paul has been sick, as Paul has planted churches and preached the gospel. Timothy has been there many times. And Paul has been training Timothy, teaching him, guiding him. So now it is Paul's hope that soon he would send him to the church at Philippi. What does Timothy mean to Paul? Verse 20, For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with the Father, he has served with me in the gospel. Think of that intimate description. That they serve together as a father and a son. Timothy being obedient to Paul. 23, I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me and I trust in the Lord. Meaning if the Lord wills that I will surely, surely I myself will come also. It is Paul's great desire to care for the church at Philippi. How? By sending Timothy, but not only Timothy, verse 25. I've thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier. And who is Epaphroditus? We see later on chapter 4, as Paul leaves the area of Macedonia after his first missionary travels, as he ministers to places such as Philippi, he leaves the region and he needs partners in ministry. But sadly, but at the same time, thankfully, it is only the church at Philippi that partners with him. But not only that, When they hear word that Paul is now in prison in Rome so many years later, they care for Paul by sending Epaphroditus 
in person to minister, to care for him, to provide financial, physical, spiritual needs. An obstacle that oftentimes keeps us from caring for the needs of others is that oftentimes we fail to recognize that others have needs, and we oftentimes fail to recognize the needs of others because oftentimes perhaps we can only see our own situation and what we need. What should strike us as we read this passage is not that Paul has great brothers in Christ such as Timothy and Epaphroditus, but that he would name these two and say, I'm going to send them to you. Who, in the context of this, who do you think is in need of help? Paul is the one who is imprisoned in Rome. Paul is the one who is in chain for the gospel. Paul is the one who is just a few short years away from his death. Paul is the one who has lost and surrendered his freedoms and his liberties. And the church of Philippi, when that society, they're not in chains. They had the support of many brothers and sisters in Christ there. They can go about their daily business. They can go to work. They can see their family. But how does Paul know and how does he end up caring for the church at Philippi? So oftentimes what blinds us from caring for the needs of others is that we can only see the needs of ourselves or in fact we fail to recognize what the needs of others are. I shared this story a little bit earlier this year. I I think it bears sharing again. Earlier this year, many of you remember, we were visited by a missionary and their family. And as they were recounting of their travels, this missionary family, they had a son and some other kids, but in particular for this son. This son was born in the States, and after a few years of living in the States, they were commissioned to go overseas to the Middle East. And so the son was uprooted from his friends and family and his schools to go to the Middle East into a foreign land, to learn a foreign language, to meet with different people that he did not know. And there they did ministry and were in the field for a few more years. Then after a few years, their visas were revoked, so they were relocated back to the United States. So again, that son was uprooted and brought back to the United States. Then after a year, They were uprooted again and commissioned to go to Europe. As the family was sharing this journey that they were going through, the thought that I had and some of other us listening that we had was this. I couldn't help but feel sorry for his son. I couldn't help but think to myself, man, I felt sorry that he couldn't just be a kid. I felt sorry that he would not get a chance to get raised in America, I thought to myself, man, this kid's missing out, right? He's missing out on burgers and fries. He's missing out on Xbox. He's, he's, he's going to go overseas. He's going to miss out on homecoming and prom and football games. He's going to miss out on the NBA. And so other people had this thought, and so they expressed to the missionary couple, man, we thank you for your sacrifice. How is your son doing? We feel so sorry for him. And the missionary's response, as I shared before, man, it blew me away. The missionary said, yeah, it's not easy. The missionary said, yeah, there are tough days and tough seasons. The missionary said, sure, it is difficult for my son. But he said this, he said, don't feel sorry for my son. In fact, My son has told me that he feels sorry for your kids. He feels sorry that your kids will only know America. He feels sorry that your kids will learn about different people and different cultures, but he gets to live in different cultures and to meet different people. We feel sorry that he's not going to be able to watch the travel channel, but he feels sorry for us because his life is the travel channel. 
we feel sorry that he's going to miss out on the NFL and basketball and American culture and Xbox. But he feels sorry for your kids that they won't get to walk out their door and share the good news of Jesus Christ with people who have never heard about Jesus before. So who is the one who's missing out? Do we have a good measure of who are the ones in need and what their needs are? So often we can be blinded that maybe we see people, they have physical things. They have more than enough monetary means. And we think to ourselves, there's nothing we can do to help them. You know, our friends, our neighbors, they have running water. They have no problem putting food on the table. How can I care for them? But we must realize, even if they have physical things, they are missing out. They have running water, but they are missing out on living water, Jesus Christ. Right? They have no problem putting food on the table, but they don't have the bread of life. They don't have Jesus. Maybe so oftentimes we don't know how to care for fellow believers. Maybe we're aware. We know that everybody has issues. Everybody has struggles. But when we see that youth, that young adult, that, that couple, maybe we've heard that they're going through some tough times. But then we see, man, well, they're still working. They're still serving hard. They're still diligent and faithful. So, you know, I think they got it under control. But do we see under all the work and all the service that they're missing out? Sure, they're plugging away. Sure. They're being consistent and faithful. They're doing all that they can do. But under the surface, do we see that in that service, there is no joy. There is no peace. There is no patience. And kind, there is no fruit of the Spirit. Right? That physically they're able but man, they need some spiritual love and care. So often we can neglect to care for others because perhaps we're too focused on our own needs to see the needs of others. We're too busy seeing who is missing out. And other times, perhaps what gets in the way is that we fail to recognize what others need. Perhaps we see the affluence around us. We see the physical prosperity and it blinds us to see the emotional, the spiritual depravity that lies underneath. Care for others, for those who seem spiritually, emotionally strong, provide for them physically. For those who seem to be physically okay, make sure that you care for them emotionally and spiritually. Paul, he's in prison in Rome. He's in chains for the gospel. He's hurting. He's suffering. But he provides and he cares for the church at Philippi because he sees even though the church at Philippi, maybe they're physically okay, but he's looking at that church and thinking, man, they need some spiritual help. He takes Timothy and Epaphroditus and he sends them to them. It's commonly believed and held that is Epaphroditus, he himself, who delivers the letter this letter to the church at Philippi. Let's see the second barrier and how Paul overcomes this barrier. Again, going back over 19 through 25. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ but you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me, and I trust in the Lord that surely I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. So oftentimes, what keeps us from caring for the needs of others is perhaps 
we can recognize that others in need. Perhaps we can recognize that people need help and care. But I know oftentimes the thing I wrestle with is, oh, I see the need that is there, but I don't know what to give them. Right? So oftentimes what paralyzes me or even my excuse is, I see that they need care, but maybe somebody else could do it better. I don't know if I have anything to provide. So what's a good guideline to answering that question? How do we know what to provide for others? Well, let's look at what Paul knows to give to others. Paul, throughout his ministry, he suffers and he goes through many hardships. What are some of those hardships and issues that Paul goes with? What hardship and persecution is Paul facing? We look back at chapter 1. He lists all those out. He doesn't have people to partner in the gospel with. In chapter 1, verse 17, it is you, those who are using selfish ambition. Verse, chapter 2, verse 3, those who are using selfish ambition. Uh, chapter 2, verse 4, those who seek their own interests those who disobey God and turn against Paul. So in life and in ministry, what is Paul being afflicted with? How is he hurting? He's hurting because there are people who are not partnering with him in the gospel. There are people who are selfishly looking to their own interests above others, and there are people who are counting themselves as more significant than Paul and other believers. And because of this, it is causing Paul great harm and heartache. Paul desires partners in the gospel who humble themselves by considering others more significant than themselves and who consider the interests of others before their own. Who are Timothy and Epaphroditus? Timothy For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. He considers the interests of others. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy, proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel, a partner in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I have, see, just as I see how it will go with me. Who is Epaphroditus? He is my brother and fellow worker, a partner in the gospel, and your messenger and minister to my needs. He considers the needs of others above himself. What does Paul give to people in need? Paul cares for those in need by giving them the exact thing he desires in his time of need. Paul desires a partner in the gospel who considers the needs of others, who considers others more significant than themselves. Timothy and Epaphroditus are partners in the gospel who have humbled themselves. And so what does Paul give to the church at Philippi? He gives them partners in the gospel who humbles themselves and to look out for the needs of of others. Brothers and sisters, let us care for one another and let us care for one another and let us know how to care for one another by giving to our brothers and sisters. Let us be the brother and sister that we wish and desire to have for ourselves. For those of you who have served and have been in positions, and as you lead and as you serve, there are those you are trying to lead and serve. But there are those who are not willing to submit. There are those who are considering their interests above yours. There are those who are considering themselves more significant than you. And it's making serving hard. And it's making your desire for a partner in the gospel who is humble. Now turn around. And face those who are leading you. 
as much as you wish and you hope that those you lead would partner with you and humble themselves, turn around and partner and humble yourselves to those who are trying to lead you. Be the partner in the gospel that you wish you had. That is how you are to know, how you are to care for others. Perhaps those are here who are suffering and hurting, going through pain, heartache, and illness, and, and, and things are going hard and tough. And all you wish that there would be brothers and sisters who would reach out and to care and to show compassion and understanding. And I earnestly pray that there would be brothers and sisters who partner with you in community and fellowship and intimate relationship in the Lord. But use that burning desire to know what you need and desire in a partner in the gospel and turn around. And even in your time of need, go and be that partner to others. As you know what it is to hurt and to feel alone, you now know how to care for others who are hurt and feel alone two barriers that we've seen. Failing to recognize that others are in need. And secondly, maybe you recognize that there is a need but not knowing what to give. Care for others as you desire to be cared according to the scriptures. Third thing, another obstacle that we oftentimes face. is in our time of need, how do we have a ministry of care? Oftentimes we recognize that a ministry of care involves caring for others, but oftentimes an obstacle of care of ministry is allowing others that you need care and inviting others to care for you. Let's follow along. Verses 25 through 30. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all, and he has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill near to death. The church at Philippi sends Epaphroditus to go minister and care for Paul. Epaphroditus shows up, cares and ministers to Paul, but at the same time falls ill almost to the point of death. The church back home hears about Ep Epaphroditus' condition and they get scared. Indeed, he was ill near to death, but God had mercy on him and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. God in his infinite Wisdom and grace spares Epaphroditus. 28, I'm the more eager to send to him Therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Paul, in his letters, Time and time again, what is not surprising is how often and how much Paul speaks about his own suffering, his own su hardships, and the suffering and the hardships of those who are serving with him. While it is not surprising that Paul would talk about his hardships and his sufferings and the sufferings of those who partner with him, as I read through this text, I feel... What stands out then is how not open we as the church today can be in sharing about our hurts, our sufferings, our hardships. When I think about it, I would not use Paul's template to send a report. So if I had to write a report to the district superintendent about how ministry here at PCAC is going, I would tell him about attendance. I would uh, tell him about how many people got baptized recently. I would tell him and send him pictures of us eating food, of us smiling. And I'm thinking, Paul, you done messed up. 
This is, this is no way to encourage back home. You're asking Philippi, the church at Philippi for support. I'm not going to tell the district superintendent that, that we went on a mission trip and lost two youth. I'm not telling that, all right? He's going to cut my support, all right? I'm not going to tell them that we almost got hit by cars. I can't let people know I'm irresponsible. We're going to get cut our support. Hey, that guy you sent to PCAC to help, yeah, he, he got sick and he almost died. Um, how about you send a few more people so they can get sick and, and almost die as well? In my narrow mind, I think to myself, the best way to encourage the body is just to sugarcoat everything and to tell people that everything is okay. But I fail to realize that I'm neglecting the body of caring when I don't tell them my own needs of what I have and I neglect the rest of the body of care when I fail to invite others to come and to care and support myself. Not to celebrate sin, not to tell you all the rotten things I've done and to celebrate that. Not to complain and grumble and tell you how miserable I am. But to share with you the burdens that are on my heart. To share you that I see that this is what scripture says it means to obey God. But man, these are all the ways I'm falling short and I'm having a hard time doing. But what makes it so hard to share? The movie Interstellar, uh, I think came out last year. Uh, So those of you who who are into it, I'm just going to butcher the science part of it. But anyway, uh, the, the basic plot and principle is this. The planet Earth is sick and dying, and the planet can no longer sustain human life for much longer. All right, so this is a movie. Since Earth is dying and cannot support human life for much longer, NASA decides to spend three astronauts, scientists, into deep space. Their job is to go to three different planets, one planet each. And their job is to look for a good planet to sustain human life, a planet to colonize, a planet to begin a new Earth, essentially. And the job of the scientists is this. When they arrive at their foreign alien planet, Their job is to survey the land and to determine whether or not this would be a good planet for for humans to live on. Once they determine if it is a good planet or a bad planet, they would then report back to Earth. If the scientist reports back, this planet is horrible, it's not going to sustain humans, then NASA will not send humans to that planet And the scientist is left there alone and will die. That's their sacrifice. If the scientist surveys the land and is a good plant that will sustain human life, they will report back to Earth, and NASA will then send humans to go colonize and to populate that planet. A lot of things happen in the movie. Eventually, they receive transmission from this one planet. And this one planet, they sent the scientist Dr. Man. Man, what a name. Dr. Man, all right? And so Dr. Man conveys back, this is a good planet. There is water. There is a good atmosphere humans can breathe. There is a star that acts like the sun to heat and to give the planet life. This is a good planet. Come to this planet. And because of this transmission, sure enough, NASA sends humans to go to that planet. But as soon as the next batch of scientists and humans arrive, they realize something is off. Something is wrong. This planet does not have water. This planet's atmosphere is toxic. It has ammonia. People can't breathe in it. This planet has no star, no sun-like star. This planet is un inhabitable. This planet is bad. It's later revealed that Dr. Man lied about the planet. The planet was bad and rotten and not good, but instead he told and he lied and said the planet was good and perfect. Why did Dr. Man 
lie. He knew that if he told others that the planet was bad, people would abandon him and people would leave him there to die. So he felt like he had to lie and he had to say everything was good so that people would come and want to be with him. Even though things are going bad in your planet, in your life, even though you have hurts and struggles and temptations and fears and doubts, do you feel that you have to lie and you have to tell everybody it's doing and we're doing great because you're afraid if you told them the truth that people would abandon you, that people will leave you on your own. So oftentimes that can be the case. So oftentimes we can run and hide in fear of those who are suffering, fear of our own limitations, fear of not knowing how to help, fear of perhaps what we would have to surrender in order to help others. I'm just naming stuff and excuses I have. How about you? And I can think of all the reasons that I'm afraid to share my doubts, my fears, and my struggles Because maybe you won't be my friend anymore. Maybe you'll look at me differently. Maybe you won't invite me around as much. In order for us to be a body of believers that cares and to love for others, we need to overcome the obstacle of recognizing who and what needs to be cared for. Those who have a physical abundance, we must recognize that they have a physical, spiritual, and emotional need. Those who seem to be strong emotionally, look out for their spiritual and physical needs. And secondly, so oftentimes maybe we're paralyzed not knowing how to care for others. Be that partner in ministry that you desire to have and be that partner to others. And third, a big component that oftentimes we leave out in caring for one another is being open and vulnerable about our own sensitivities, our own vulnerabilities, and encouraging and inviting others to come and care for others. Let us pray. As we close in worship again and praise this morning, Let us consider and reflect on the word. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you convict us of sin and righteousness, that you open our hearts, our minds, our eyes. that you give us your eyes to see, that our lens would not be from a worldly perspective, but that we see the world through Scripture. Help us to recognize the needs of others around us and what those needs are. That there are many around us who may seem happy because they have a lot of things and stuff. They may seem okay because they're busy and their calendars are full, But Lord, help us to see that without Christ that there is no true happiness, that there is no peace, that without Christ being busy is laboring in vain, and that we would be moved to go and to help and to care. For our brothers and sisters here as a church family, we may oftentimes scratch our heads and wonder how do we care for one another? A good place to start Let us be that partner in the gospel that we wish that we had. Let us humbly submit to the Lord and to one another to put our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, consider their interests above ours, to consider them more significant than ourselves. As well, let us be brave and have courage 
to share our struggles, our fears, our doubts. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that if we're faithful to share our struggles, our fears, our doubts, that we'll be able to see just how much you'll never leave us nor forsake us. That as we share our needs, you would bring brothers and sisters in Christ who are ready to love and to care. We cannot do this on our own, but and we cannot do this by our own might. So that's why I pray, Holy Spirit, that you fill us and you control us to obey the Father's will. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.